Let's now look at the details as to how the central nervous system processes information that's being carried out of each retina by a corresponding optic nerve. And this diagram on this page illustrates the anatomy of the visual pathways. First, before we start processing actual visual information using neurons, let's talk about what the optics of the eye do to all visual images. And the answer is kind of shown at the top of the figure. First off, visual fields are classically subdivided into two hemifields. So each eye is responding to information that's in a pair of nasal hemifields, which means they're close to the midline, corresponding to the nose, or in a pair of temporal hemifields that really represent peripheral vision. But here's the point. The optics of the eye transform any visual image that's initially being seen in a nasal or a temporal hemifield and reverse and invert that optical image like a camera. The net effect of that is shown by the crossed arrows. What this means is that a visual image that's perceived in a nasal hemifield will be reversed and inverted and will stimulate cells on the temporal half of the corresponding retina. And by the same token, a visual image that's being perceived in a temporal hemifield will be reversed and inverted and will end up stimulating cells on the nasal half of a corresponding retina. So you must remember about the reversal and the inversion of visual images prior to stimulation of any of the neural pathways because otherwise the visual processing and the lesions won't make any sense. They'll all be backwards. So now let's take the information out of each eye. We know that the optic nerve leaves basically out of the medial side of each eyeball. And we already know that the optic nerve axons represent the second neuron of three neurons utilized in visual processing. So the point is, if the optic nerves represent the second neurons, then if they follow the rule, their axons must cross the midline. So here are the two differences. Number one, only some of the optic nerve axons cross, only about 60% of them. And unlike other sensory neural systems, the crossed axons, the crossing of the axons, does not occur within the range of their cell bodies. There's obviously a significant course, basically, in each optic nerve before the axons cross. So where do the axons cross, and which axons of the optic nerve actually do cross? You can see it illustrated on here, here on the picture. And number three is the location of the optic chiasm. The optic chiasm is where about 60% of the optic nerve axons from each eye cross the midline. But note specifically which optic nerve axons are crossing. They are the optic nerve axons coming from each nasal retina. So it's nasal retina optic nerve axons that are actually crossing. Note that the temporal retina optic nerve axons do not cross and simply pass back through the optic nerve into the optic tract on a corresponding side. But let's extend this one step further. Yes, we've said that physically it is nasal retina optic nerve axons that are crossing the midline. But what kind of visual hemifield information is really crossing at the optic chiasm? The answer is temporal hemifield information, and that's the point to remember. All right, then once the axons cross to the optic chiasm from the nasal retina, and the op they are joined by the uncrossed optic nerve axons from the temporal retina, and they form an optic tract. The optic tract is indicated by a lesion here at number four. So what really is the optic tract? The optic tract is nothing more than a remixed optic nerve. It's the same axons but it has some axons that came across the midline from the opposite eye in the optic chiasm, and it contains some optic nerve axons that came from the temporal half of the ipsilateral eye. So it's just a remixed optic nerve optic tract. Then you can see on this picture that the major destination, not the only, but the major destination of optic tract axons is to synapse with third neurons in the thalamus, the lateral geniculate body in this case, and then the axons of the lateral geniculate body project back to primary visual cortex by coursing in the optic radiations. And we'll make a distinguished feature a little later that visual cortex is subdivided into two pieces. There's a cuneus gyrus 
and there's a lingual gyrus that make up primary visual cortex. All right. Now, our next point is, how can we distinguish and arrive at a kind of a classification scheme to distinguish where a lesion is based on the patient's visual field deficits? So first off, over on the left side of this page are a series of circles with various parts of each circle, or both circles, shaded. The shading indicates a loss of perception in a visual field, in a visual field. So when you see drawings of circles in these pairs, they always represent what a patient can't see in one or both hemifields, quadrants, or what have you, based on a lesion site. So in our little example here, we're going to develop a series of lesions that occur fundamentally on the right side of the visual processing pathway. We could have an equal number of lesions on the left side of the pathway, but we're just using this as an example. All right. Let's start this process by saying, what is going to be characteristic on the next slide of any lesion to a part or all of an optic nerve, meaning the lesion is somewhere in front of the optic chiasm? Well, there are two characteristic features of all of these visual field deficits. One is they're going to be monocular, meaning that there's only going to be shading indicating a visual field loss in one circle, and the circle where the visual field loss will be will be on the circle representing the visual fields associated with that eye. So any lesion in front of the chiasm to an optic nerve is going to result in a monocular and an ipsilateral deficit. Causes of this, optic neuritis that's seen in about 40% of the patients that develop multiple sclerosis. And again, if there were a central retinal artery occlusion, that's the anatomic end artery that supplies the entire retina. If there's a vascular occlusion of it, the patient will have a complete anopsy or loss of vision in that eye. And as we'll see in a minute when we look at the diagram, a partial cause of a monocular and ipsilateral nerve lesion, optic nerve lesion, might be the result of a medially medially expanding aneurysm of an internal carotid artery. So let's go back and look at the diagram now because our two lesions that affect the left optic nerve are illustrated at number one and number two. And again, you can see over on the left side that the deficits match up with those, and the deficits basically are monocular and ipsilateral. They only result in a partial or a complete visual field loss in the circle on the left, an ipsilateral relationship. So if we had a complete lesion, a severe case of optic neuritis in a patient with MS, for example, or a central artery occlusion, that would result in an an anopsia, total loss of vision associated with the left eye. Next, a lesion at number two, which affects the optic nerve fibers just in front of the chiasm, might be the result, as we said, of a medially expanding aneurysm of an internal carotid artery, which is coursing very close to that portion of the optic nerve. But note what's affected. The aneurysm will only compress the fibers on the outside, in this case of the left left optic nerve, just in front of the chiasm. And the axons of the optic nerve on the outside of the optic nerve are coming from the left temporal retina that results in a left nasal hemianopsia. So a nasal hemianopsia, when when presented ipsilaterally, may be the result, as we said, of that medially expanding aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. All right. Next, next lesion is a very important one, and it's probably the most common lesion site of any part of the visual processing pathways, and this is a lesion that occurs at the chiasm, at the chiasm, meaning that this lesion or these lesions are crossing just the crossed axons of the optic nerve that are at the chiasm. Now, these lesion presentations are certainly going to be very different. These deficits are going to be binocular, indicating that we're going to have a visual field loss in both eyes or both circles. These lesions are not only binocular, they're exclusively bitemporal. Because as we said, and we'll see this again in the diagram, that the optic nerve axons that are crossing at the chiasm are coming from the nasal retina of each eye, but the kind of visual information that's being processed by each nasal retina is bitemporal visual hemifield information. Next, 
these deficits and only these deficits are heteronymous, meaning different. And what we're going to see is because they are bitemporal, we are going to lose shading or have shading on the left side of one circle, but on the right side of the other circle, which is a heteronymous visual field deficit. So let's do two things. Let's look at the picture first, and then we'll go back and talk about some, uh, some specific lesions involving pituitary tumors. So first off, here is the diagram going back, and you can see now that number three is the location of chiasm compression. As we've already indicated, we are compressing the optic nerve axons that have come from a nasal retina on both sides, and over at number three in the, on the diagram on the left, we see a bitemporal heteronymous hemianopsia, where basically we have shading indicating a visual field loss, bitemporal one, indicated by shading on the left side of the left circle, but the shading is on the right side of the right, cir right circle, a heteronymous visual field deficit. Next, let's go back to our commentary because we need to make the distinction in the forms of pituitary tumors because certainly the most common cause of chiasm compression is by a pituitary tumor. But there are really two common forms of tumors that compress the chiasm, and depending on where they start their compression, can give rise to slightly different bitemporal deficits. And I've subdivided them here as lesion 3A and 3B, even though we don't make the distinction on the actual diagram. Note that a pituitary adenoma tends to compress the chiasm, the crossing axons of the chiasm, from below. And what that means is it's compressing optic nerve axons that have come from the inferior quadrants of each retina. But because of the optics of the eye, that really means what's affected is superior quadrant information. So granted, a large pituitary tumor can result in a bitemporal heteronymous hemianopsia, but it may begin as a bitemporal superior quadrantinopsia because the initial visual field loss will be in the upper temporal quadrant of each eye. In contrast, a craniopharyngioma, calcified remnant of Rathke's pouch, more likely to be seen in younger individuals than a pituitary adenoma, classically begins by compressing the optic nerve axons that are crossing in the top of the optic chiasm that are coming from the upper quadrants of each retina. And by the same analogy, this will present initially as a bitemporal inferior quadrantinopsia that again can expand and obviously form a heteronymous hemianopsia if the tumor is large enough. So just recognize that there are two common forms of pituitary tumor that can compress the optic chiasm, beginning partially and obviously extending, as we already see in this picture. If complete, you will, the patient will have a bitemporal heteronymous hemianopsia. All right, what's going to be characteristic of lesions past the chiasm? Certainly, there are a number of possible lesion sites that would categorize this. They certainly would include a lesion of an optic tract, a lateral geniculate body, some or all of the visual radiations, and or primary visual cortex as well. So these lesions, again, like chiasm compression, are going to be binocular, but that's where the similarity ends. All lesions past the chiasm are homonymous, which means that the visual field deficits are going to be represented by a shading loss on the same side of each circle, either the left side or the right side. And the other interesting feature about these is these deficits are all contralateral, meaning that the visual field loss will be represented, for example, by shading on the left half of each circle, but the lesion location will be somewhere on the right side of the visual processing pathway, somewhere past the optic chiasm. And typically, these are the result of vascular insults. If you lesion basically parts of the optic tract, or, part, or, very, or parts of the visual radiations, that's an MCA infarct. If you lesion the more posterior portion, particularly of the visual radiations or primary visual cortex, you're likely, that's likely to be the result of a PCA infarct. All right, let's see how these are characteristic and how they differ. So again, looking at our diagram, we can see now that we have a number of lesions that are past the chiasm. 
They are a complete lesion of the left optic tract indicated by number four and a partial lesion of some of the visual radiations at five or at six and or a lesion basically in primary visual cortex at number seven. All of those lesions, four, five, six, and seven, are certainly lesions past the optic chiasm on the left and they're going to result in different forms of a contralateral or a right homonymous visual field deficit. All right, so let's get specific. First off, let's deal with number four because it's the most straightforward of them. A lesion at number four, which is a complete lesion of the left optic tract, will result, if it's complete, and it rarely is actually, in a right or a contralateral homonymous hemianopsia that's diagrammed at number four on the figure to the left of our visual processing picture. Obviously, that would be the same case if we had a complete lesion of a lateral geniculate body. All right. If we had a complete lesion of the visual radiations, complete lesion, meaning a lesion of both five and six, again, we would have a contralateral or a right homonymous hemianopsia. And that's the next point of this picture, and that is that the visual radiations, which certainly if lesion completely would result in a homonymous hemianopsia, but it turns out that half of the visual radiations in what is known as Myers loop take a little excursion anteriorly into a corresponding temporal lobe before making a hairpin turn to sweep back, join the non-Myers loop visual radiations, and project to primary visual cortex. So the point of this picture is we can have a selective lesion of either the non-Myers loop fibers at number six or the Myers loop axons, for example, in a patient with an MCA infarct or even a temporal lobe tumor. So we need to be sensitive about what a partial visual radiation lesion would present with. For example, if we lesion the fibers of the Myers loop on the left, certainly the same criteria have to apply because this is a specialized lesion past the chiasm. So if I have a left side Myers loop lesion, I'm going to have a right side homonymous visual field deficit. But here's the point. Over in the box on the lower right portion of this page is a comment that says that visual information coming from the lower quadrant of each retina is coursing in the fibers that make up Myers loop. So what that means because of the optics of the eye is that yes, physically, Myers loop axons are carrying information that came out of the lower quadrants of each retina. But what that really means is Myers loop is processing upper quadrant visual information. So having said that, let's be complete now, because what would we see in terms of a patient that has a left Myers loop lesion? They're going to have a contralateral or a right homonymous superior quadrant defect, a right homonymous superior quadrant anopsia, or what we call a slice of pie defect in the contralateral sky. And this, as we've indicated, can be the result of a temporal lobe tumor on the corresponding side, or an isolated vascular insult of the middle cerebral artery that just supplies the portion of Myers loop as it's going through the temporal lobe. And by the, anal by the analogy, then what would we see if we had a patient that had a non-Myers loop lesion at number six? Well, we'd have the inverse of the Myers loop. We would have, if we had a patient with a left non-Myers loop lesion, the patient would present with a right homonymous inferior quadrant anopsia. And as we've indicated, we added them both together. If we had a complete lesion of the visual radiations on the left at five and six, the patient would have the lesion that's at number four, analogous to a complete optic tract lesion that would result in a right homonymous hemianopsia. So last point about this is, other than the fact that a complete lesion of an optic tract or a complete lesion of the visual radiations would present with the same visual field deficit, is there a way you can tell the difference between the two lesion sites? And the answer is yes. What is going to be the effect on the pupillary light reflex if you have an optic tract lesion? The patient is going to have a slightly suppressed pupillary light reflex because the optic tract still contains the optic nerve fibers that in addition to synapsing in the lateral geniculate body are also going to project to the pretectal area. So, a patient with an optic tract lesion will have the homonymous hemianopsia, but with a slightly suppressed pupillary light reflex. 
In contrast, if a patient has an optic radiation lesion, there will be no effect on the pupillary light reflex that will accompany, basically, the homonymous hemianopsia. So the vision field deficits will be the same, but you can tell the difference in lesion location because of the effect on the light reflex with an optic tract lesion versus the lack of an effect, the absence of any effect on the light reflex with an optic radiation lesion. All right, last point of this picture is to illustrate that specifically, where do the optic radiations go? We've already alluded to this. Note that the axons that make up Myers loop end up synapsing in the lingual gyrus. So the lingual gyrus is the cortical area that is ultimately processing upper quadrant visual hemifield information contralaterally. And that the non-Myers loop fibers end up synapsing in the cuneus gyrus, which is obviously processing the inferior quadrants of visual space. All right, and then our last point is, what is going to be unique about a cortex lesion itself? So I basically, I've made that point on the next slide. If we have a lesion just inside primary visual cortex and not to any of the fiber pathways leading to it, the patient is still going to have a homonymous hemianopsia, assuming that the lesion is complete. And this is usually the result of a posterior cerebral artery vascular insult because the posterior cerebral artery supplies all of primary visual cortex on a corresponding side. But inside visual cortex lesions alone present not only with the homonymous hemianopsia, they also present with macular sparing. Because as we indicated earlier, remember that the macular cortex or macular vision represents foveal vision, the cones only visual acuity portion of the visual pathway. And because of the importance of macular vision, macular cortex is unique in that it has a readily available collateral blood supply. Because macular cortex is supplied not only by branches of the posterior cerebral artery, it's also supplied by branches of an adjacent middle cerebral artery. So patients with cortex lesions will have macular sparing. And again, if we look at the picture as we've alluded to earlier, an intracortex lesion is shown at number seven. So again, same rules apply. We are in the left primary visual cortex. So assuming the lesion is, or the vascular insult is complete, the patient will result in a right homonymous hemianopsia. But this patient with just an intravisual cortex lesion alone will have macular sparing, where the central portion of each visual field, macular vision, is spared by the indication of the semicircle that's presented in the lesion diagram at number seven. So again, visual deficits are likely to be matched very closely with a number of lesion sites and exam questions. And certainly using the lesion strategy as we've expressed, you can now distinguish in a patient that has an optic nerve lesion, one and two, that only has an ipsilateral anopsia, whereas chiasm compression caused by pituitary tumors is going to be the single location of a bitemporal heteronymous visual field deficit. And as we've seen, there are a number of lesion sites past the chiasm, all of which result in homonymous contralateral deficits, complete lesions involving an optic tract, which suppresses the light reflex, partial or complete lesions in five and six involving the visual radiations, and the macular sparing deficits that are unique to a visual cortex lesion.